Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, a very special Father's Day edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are very, very excited. Our guest today, has, he's been a friend of the show, and he is an exceptional author. He's also an exceptional dad. He is the author of the uh, brand new book from Familius, The Little Book of Foster Care Wisdom. Our guest today is our friend, Dr. John DeGarmo. Hey, dads, if you're looking for something fun to do, be sure that you pick up your copy of The Last Surviving Dinosaur, The Tarantacrankosaurus, written by Stephen Joseph and playfully illustrated by Andy Case. Here's a, a five-star review that j- was just released. Meet the Tarantacrankosaurus, the cranky dinosaur who survived the Dark Ages and became the oldest ancestor of mankind. The story is set in Jewish culture where everybody got together and spoke about the source. Uh, that, that's a Yiddish word that means complaint. A- and everybody complained about the source with a sense of pride. This beautiful story will show young readers how to talk about their problems instead of being consumed by them. Woven deftly through the life of a Jewish family and told through the eyes of the Tarantacrankosaurus, the smallest dinosaur on the planet, the story is a good way to help readers, both children and adults, deal with crankiness in a good way. The last surviving dinosaur, the Tarantacrankosaurus, reminds readers to be mindful of when and how often they complain. A lesson from which all readers, young and old, can benefit. The Last Surviving Dinosaur by Stephen Joseph. It's available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other sites where books are sold. You know, we love the fact that so many authors listen to the show. We also love the fact that we hear from a number of listeners who tell us that they aspire to be a, a children's author. Well, I have great news for you. Our friend Megan Meehan would love you to be a part of her eight-week children's writing class. Now, check this out. At the end of the class, every single participant will have completed a children's book, which will then be professionally illustrated, audio narrated, and produced as an e-book through Smart Kids Club Publishing. All right. So you're going to take a class. You're going to learn the art of children's writing and At the end of the class, you're going to have a children's book is going to be written and it is guaranteed to be published. Megan Meehan is a published novelist, poet, produced playwright and screenwriter who is known to the children's book community through her latest release titled Abila's Adventure. It tells the story of a Brazilian parent who parent who moves to New York City. This really is a fantastic opportunity. The, the eight week long class is going to be hosted entirely online at the Wet Ink Class platform. Now this allows you to attend the classes at your own pace. It, there's a start date and there's an end date, but when you attend classes, when you turn in your assignments, that's up to you. And like we said, at the end of the class, your book will be published and promoted via the Smart Kids Club social media platforms. I, this is just such a, an amazing opportunity, and it's really, really affordable. The full price of the eight-week class, including the professionally illustrated and narrated story, audio interview on blasting news, and a free copy of the published book, is only $485 per person. If you were to try to go out and, and, and write your book and have it edited and have it formatted and have it illustrated, it would cost a lot more than $485. And if that great affordable price isn't enough to convince you, check this out. They have payment plans that start as low as $20 per week. You need to you need to contact Megan directly, and it's easy to do. All you need to do is to email her at Meehan, M-S, at AOL.com. That's M-E-E-H-A-N-M-S at AOL.com. Joining us right now from a magical kingdom down in Orlando, Florida. Our guest today has been a guest in the past, and we're so excited to have him back. He is the author of a number of fantastic books. The one we're going to start talking about today is The Little Book of Foster Care Wisdom. Please welcome back to the show foster care expert, Dr. John DeGarmo. John, how are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity today. Uh, 
Dr. John has been on my shows for the last couple of years, and it's always a pleasure to talk to him. He has really opened up my eyes so much to foster care and and the relationships that that we can develop with kids who are in the foster system, whether they uh, their direct relationships is bringing them into our families or being able to support them while they're living with other families and um it's just brought a whole lot of joy to my life, so I'm really excited to have you back. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So why don't you give us a little thumbnail of the latest book uh, from our friends at Famil- Familius, a little book of foster care wisdom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I wanted to write a book that foster parents could have that they could turn to every single day for some inspiration, for some tips, for some help. You know, it's, it's a bit challenging being a foster parent. It's a, it can be a difficult, uh, difficult lifestyle. And so I wanted to write a book that foster parents could have on their, on their nightstand and they could open it up every morning, kind of like a little devotional book of sorts filled with tips every day and filled with inspirational quotes. And it really turned out super nice. I'm so excited about this book. Yeah, we're real excited. And I was really excited to hear that you're working with our friends at Familius and their whole their 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 whole company is is focused on helping families be happy and i'm really happy that they expanded that to helping families with uh, kids from all different backgrounds be happy yeah yeah they're a great company um uh, this is my first book with them and i'm enjoying it yeah it's fantastic now john just let folks know who who haven't heard you before you you're not just talking from academic wisdom this is something that you and your family have been living uh, for years, how many foster kids or how many kids have you brought into your home over the years? Well, we've had over 60 kids come through our home the last uh, 17 years. We just had a 17-year-old girl with us for a short time. Um, she was homeless, and she stayed with us until she graduated from high school. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. I've, I've, I've done all the research. I've written all the books, and I have lived the lifestyle, and it's, it's probably been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And one of the things that you really blew me away at was the number of kids in the foster care system. If I'm not mistaken, I think you told me at one time there's typically 400,000 kids in the foster care system on any given day. I think we're closer to 500,000. Whoa. It's incredible. And kids end up in foster care through absolutely no fault of their own, but just incredible circumstances. And... Um, it really is heartbreaking that, you know, they've, they've suffered and in many cases suffered great tr- trauma and they're, they're thrown into a system that sometimes adds to that trauma. Well, it's a system that's really, uh, really struggling to handle. That's for sure right now. And you're right. The kids didn't do anything wrong. They're, they're victims of abuse. They're victims of neglect. They're victims of abandonment. Uh, right now we're seeing a lot of children flood into foster care because of the opiate crisis. Their parents are being hospitalized or incarcerated or even dying from the opiate epidemic that is that is really strangling our nation. And there are not enough foster parents out there. Every state is really struggling with this right now. Mm-mm-mm. Tell us, um, share with us just a little, I want to get back to talking about the, the issues and the challenges facing kids in the foster care system and families. But just share with us a little bit of the wisdom that we can find in the little book of foster care wisdom. Well, um, pretty much everything that a foster parent needs to know, I break it down into, into units. There's, there's a many days or weeks about working with kids, uh, who are struggling in school. There are days or weeks, uh, together about online safety for kids and, and foster families, because there's lots of dangers they face there. Uh, how to welcome your child from the foster care home, how to, how to help them with their anxieties they face, uh, a little bit about adoption, a little bit about when a child leaves their home, everything. It's all in there. You know, you got 365 days of really strong tips and suggestions and strategies for foster parents. As a foster parent, now we're, we're, we're publishing this on Father's Day, and so folks who are listening to it on Father's Day, that's fantastic. But, you know, I think we can celebrate Father's Day every single day of the year. Uh, you... Most most people come go into fatherhood, you know, typically the their biological dads. But you know, as a, a foster dad, you make the choice to love these kids coming into your home. 
Talk about the joy that that's brought into your life and, in, 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 you know, in, in, as we celebrate Father's Day. Well, you know, I've, I've had kids as young as 27 hours old. I've had children as old as 18 years of age and everything in between. Every child that comes through my home is, you know, it's unique. It's there. Every child is unique. Every child brings with them their own unique challenges, own unique set of anxieties and traumas. But all they also all bring their own unique set of joys and celebrations. Um, and uh, it's it's a life full of surprises, daily surprises, daily um, daily uh, experiences. Um, I'm always learning something about myself and about children in general, about the importance of family. Uh, and every child has really made me a better person in some way. You, you, you're talking about learning things from, from every kid and surprises. Uh, is, is there one kind of funny moment or, or real surprise that stands out amongst all the other different experiences you, you've had with the kids over the years? Oh, where do you start? Where do you start? <laughs> um, let me see. Well, you know, I, I've seen kids as, as, as old as four or five learn how to speak for the first time. Um, I've seen so many children learn how to smile and learn how to laugh for the very first time. Kids as old as seven or eight years of age learn how to laugh for the first time. Um, you know, learning, teaching kids how to read and write when they're, you know, nine, ten years of age, um, who've never really had that before. Uh, teaching kids learn, uh, to learn the importance of self-worth and self-value and that they matter and more importantly that someone loves them. And really watching kids um, open up and begin to heal from all the pain they've suffered. You know, those, they're all wonderful experiences. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back in my early life and remembering volunteering in, in Boston Public School when I was in high school and college. And, you know, the, just the joy that I experienced when I helped a first grader who was struggling to read kind of, you know, sound out his first word and kind of figure out the phonics and, and how to put those sounds together to form a word. And it just must be incredible to have that seven-year-old who's come from such trauma and such tragedy and to know that you help them experience joy and, and experience that first smile. That must be a tremendous tremendous blessing it is it is it really is it's a true it's a tremendous blessing you're right i've learned so much um from these kids that have come through my home and my life is so filled with with joy with love with laughter because of all the kids that have come through my home oh yeah absolutely now, one of the things that i learned the first very first time i talked to dr john uh, about Foster, foster kids. We've had international kids in our home, and that was wonderful. My wife isn't at a place right now where she's ready to be a foster mom, but one of the things you talked about was just supporting foster families that are in the neighborhood. And while we didn't go out looking for it, that sort of situation happened in our lives. And it's been such a blessing, and I refer to my niece many times on this show. And, and I had been referring to her as my foster niece, which technically she is. But one of the things that, that John helped me understand is he doesn't differentiate between the kids who were in his home who were biological or foster. And I made that switch. And it was, you know, a simple switch in my own mind, but it made a huge difference in my life. And as you were saying, having this person in my life has brought me so much joy and, and happiness. Well, yeah, you know, no kid wants that label placed upon them, mm -hmm. foster child. It's, that's an ugly, ugly label that comes with so many stereotypes and misconceptions and heavy baggage. So, you know, we don't refer to them as, as foster children or children from foster care. They don't want that label, and they shouldn't have to have that label thrust upon them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, so talk about some of the ways, please, that – with families that that aren't ready to be foster families can just support kids who are in the system. Oh, you know, there's so many ways. I just had a book come out called The Church mm -hmm. and Foster Care, responding to the uh, to God's call. Uh, yeah, this is a, a a great opportunity. Not everybody can be a foster parent, like your wife, but everybody can help in some way. And uh, there's so many ways we can help. We can become mentors or tutors. 
to these children because they're struggling in school. They're struggling in school. Most kids in foster care are at least a year and a half behind academically. We can provide new uh, clothing to the children or to foster families or bags, school bags filled with school supplies and hygiene items or maybe even a stuffed animal for those first few nights of placement. We can help them develop new skills by, um, by having them become an apprentice of some sort in our, in our, if we own our own business. Mm-hmm. We can, um, we can adopt, if you will, a quote unquote, a child during the Christmas holiday season and help foster parents buy presents for those kids. Uh, those are just a few of the many, many ways that we can help kids without being foster parents ourselves. Yeah, one of the things that I learned in our conversations and conversations with, with adults who went through the system as when they were kids is something that was horrible to me and it really opened up my eyes for the most, for most kids in foster care when they are moved from one setting to another and, and oftentimes they, they're moved multiple times in a year. Uh, right. The way they move is they're handed a green plastic trash bag to put their right. belongings in. Right, right. And it's so humiliating. It's so humiliating for the child, but they don't want that. Mm-hmm. They don't want that. But you're right. So many times the uh, the caseworker uh, arrives suddenly at the home and, uh, you know, they have, to, they have to quickly, very, very quickly throw everything together in a black plastic bag. Um, and that, so when the kids leave our home, we like them to leave with their own brand new suitcase, something they can take with them. Um, and that really gives them a, self, a sense of self-worth, that they, they are important enough for a suitcase. Because that black plastic bag or that green plastic bag, whatever it may, color it might be, that's a symbol for them. Mm-hmm. Symbol <laughs> they are trash. That's what it looks like for them. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're not worth anything. They're worth trash. So... You know, another way to help is to buy, have a suitcase drive in your area. Brand new suitcases for kids in foster care in your area. All you have to do is just contact your local foster care agency or child welfare agency in your area. And then maybe your church or your school or your place of business, whatever it might be, can host a suitcase drive for the kids. Now, you've dedicated your family, your wife and, and your family, you've, you've dedicated your life to foster kids and I'm I, I the little bit I know about you you, know, you may have always had a, a kind of a tug in that direction it, but, but you weren't always a foster dad you were in professional wrestling and your wife and you were both yeah. in up with people what right. was it what was it that that kind of put you in this direction and and open to get get you and your wife to open up your hearts and your home to foster kids well it really wasn't until the death of my first child um, and I recognize the miracle that is birth. My wife and I had never taken drugs or alcohol or cigarettes, and yet here we are. We had our first child die of a condition that that was so very very rare. And uh, I spent I spent a great deal of time in grief uh, and anger and uh, denial and a lot of really 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 tough time for me. But when I came out of it um, after some years. Uh, I was teaching at a rural high school, and I noticed a lot of kids in my classroom were uh, suffering from um, a lot of absences or, or bad grades or discipline, and I kept asking myself, what's the problem? What's the correlation? Why so many kids in the small rural town? And then I met so many of their birth parents, and I recognized, you know, it starts in the home. It really does start in the home. I have lost my first child. How can I help other kids? Mm-hmm. What can I do to make a difference for other children? And that's that led to foster parenting. And it's and you've opened up you've opened up so many people's eyes because you go around the the country and the world speaking uh, about about the issues and you also did, did a wonderful thing that that I, I was a small part of is you opened up a group home for for kids who are I think you call it forever home for older kids who uh, have trouble being placed into long term foster families. Yeah, that's right. It's called Never Too Late. It's a it's a home for boys, a residential home for boys. And right now, at this very very moment, we are transitioning to a to an older age group, boys between the ages of sixteen to eighteen, to help with that area. So we have to re uh, you know go through change our policies and procedure manual right now. But we've had we've had some 
some really wonderful experiences with some of the boys who've come to stay with us. And we're looking forward to the, to, to, uh, the new, the new change in this, and, um, in this new home. It's going to be great. Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. One of the things I think that we don't, we don't realize, and, and maybe you can help me with this is, is, you know, it's, we're providing, you're talking about providing foster homes for, for younger kids, and you think about it, six, seven, 15, 16, but there, there's a, a lot of kids, when they age out of the foster care system, that's when a lot of them really struggle. Am I right about that? They don't have the families that can help them get into colleges or trade schools, and they don't have that support anymore. You're absolutely right. They don't. You know, were you ready at age 18 or age 21? No, I certainly wasn't. No way was I ready. But these kids are on their own. They're on their own, uh, and they have no one to call upon when they are sick or when they are um, in trouble or when they are struggling. Uh, no one to call upon when they have a flat tire on a rainy Sunday night or to bring them chicken noodle soup uh, when they're sick or any place to go, Christmas, Thanksgiving, holidays. 55% of these youth will drop out of school. 65% will end up homeless. 75% will end up incarcerated. And for so many others, the cycle will start again for the next generation of kids. So aging out is a very, very tough time for these children. And you know what? I didn't know anything about that before I was a foster parent. And I think most society doesn't recognize um, the challenges these kids face as well when they, when they age out. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and they're, they're aging out and, you know, you were mentioning you and I being ready at 18 and 21 years old with a family, with support, with, you know, parents who were, or, you know, providing us with, with great role models. And now you're talking about kids who didn't have that, who bounced around from one facility to another. And now they're aged out and it's like, all right, here you go. Here's, here's right, here's right, and they're suffering. They're, they're still suffering from their ther- from their abuse, their anxiety, their trauma. Mm-hmm. They don't have the mental health services that they desperately need. They're all alone. No one has shown how to take care of themselves. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They don't have any. They don't have the financial skills or the financial resources to care for themselves. Um, yeah, it's just heartbreaking what happens to so many of them. And and. One of the reasons I wanted you on here on Father's Day is because I think all of us, men, women, we're all parents, and I think we're all we're all called to be parents. Whether it's directly being parenting, parenting to foster kids, or our kids, adopted kids, but we all have a responsibility to help kids succeed in in this world. And I, I, I wanted you on to kind of challenge people to. To understand that there are kids out there who are suffering, there are kids out there who need all of us, and and you may not be able to be a foster parent, but there's so many more things that you can do. Well, and- let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. You know, right now, as as we were discussing this, and people are listening, there are children suffering in every single community, mm-hmm. in every single neighborhood, and sometimes even in our own families. You know, we don't want to recognize it or acknowledge it. But there are children right now who are suffering horrible abuse, horrible trauma. They're being neglected. They're being abandoned. There's children out there who've never had someone say, I love you. Mm-hmm. And, and we can all make a difference. What happens to these kids otherwise? 300,000 kids end up victim to child sex trafficking in our nation. And again, something we don't want to talk about because it makes us feel uncomfortable. But we have a responsibility because we need to open up our eyes. It's all around us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And – I believe we have a moral responsibility to, to do that. If, if you're not there, if you don't believe you have a moral responsibility, just think of it as a practical, from a practical, practical sense. These are kids that are out there. They're human beings. They're alive. They're going to be with us. We're going to be caring for them, whether it's in the, the penal system or in a mental health system. We need to reach out. And if we can help them at a younger age, then they have a much better chance to grow up and to to have happy lives, to be productive, to be great neighbors. You're absolutely right. Could have said it better. Yeah. What book, if, if, a, if a family is out there and they're thinking about it, which one of the many books that you've written would you suggest uh, families take a look at in terms of you know, helping them decide whether or not they're right to be a foster family? Oh, you know, there's two I think out there that are. 
that are very good for people thinking about it. There is the uh, the book Fostering Love, One Foster Parent's Journey. It's my memoir of my first 10 years as a foster parent. I wanted to write a book that didn't sugarcoat foster parenting, but told explain what it really was like uh, from, a, from a parent's perspective, filled with lots of humor, lots of emotion, lots of sadness, lots of joy. Um, a no holds barred, if you will. And then for people of faith, there's the book Faith and Foster Care, which explores it on the faith based aspect. And I really wanted to, to challenge everybody. If, if you are a member of a church or synagogue or a mosque, check out the church and foster care, because I think that's really it's something that, that I'm trying to work on in, in my parish. Uh, we have a great ministry to, to folks in, in, um, homeless shelters, but I want to kind of, Step up, step up and be proactive and start, um, helping kids and, and do that, that, that suitcase drive at our church. So we're working on that and I challenge anybody who's part of a faith community to, to definitely check out the church in foster care. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Where can folks go to find out about all of your books? Not only the little book of foster care wisdom, but all of the books that you've published. You can go to the Foster Care Institute. If you just look up that online, the Foster Care Institute, or just Google my name, Dr. John DeGarmo, foster care expert, and you will find my books, lots of videos, resources, articles, our appearance on uh, Wife Swap, which we just did uh, last month. Uh, <laughs> lots of great stuff on there. Yeah. I have to, I have to check that out. And uh, I, Yes, I'm excited to to see that. Uh, any last parting words that you, either uh, encouragement for folks who are who are thinking about it, um, or just some motivation to get us up off our butts and and to start helping kids. Yeah, sure. I'll leave us with this one thought here. You know, I can't change the world, mm -hmm. and you can't change the world, and the listeners can't change the world. But for the kids that we choose to help, that we choose. To help, whether being a foster parent, whether supporting a foster child or fo supporting foster parents, for those kids, their world is changed. We can't change the world, but for these children, their world is changed. And that is how we help children heal and make this a better planet. Amen. Amen. We've been talking to the author of the brand new book from Familius, Little Book of Foster Care Wisdom and so many others, Dr. John DeGarmo. John, thank you so much for being back on the show. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be our friend Jennifer Swanson, the dean of all things STEM and STEAM here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's going to be another STEM Tuesday edition of the show. You do not want to miss it. Hey, if you are the author of a great children's book, we would love to give you an opportunity to tell the world about the book by being a guest on the podcast. Being guests is fun, it's easy, and it gives you the chance to tell thousands and thousands of people about your great children's book. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let my producer Fatima know about your book. We will let you know about the next easy steps. We would like to thank Dr. John DeGarmo for being on the show today. Be sure to check out the little book of Foster Care Wisdom. We also want to thank Megan Meehan. Check out her online children's writing class. What a great opportunity. You can email her directly, MeehanMS at AOL.com. We also want to thank Stephen Joseph and the last surviving dinosaur, the Taranta Crankosaurus. And, of course, I want to thank my amazing producer, Fadi Makan. I want to thank my beautiful wife, and I want to thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the program. Thank you so much for making the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.